I'm Frederick. I'm the founder of Polar Signals. Um, <clears throat> and today we want to talk about uh, cloud native eBPF beyond the hype. Um, as you can probably imagine, um, we use eBPF at Polar Signals, and that's essentially why I'm here. But um, the idea of this talk is to kind of um, take this technology this ha that has been hyped over the last couple of years um, and see how we can uh, kind of connect it in a meaningful way to the cloud native ecosystem to create some useful things. Uh, so hopefully you'll walk out of this talk understanding eBPF a little bit more, understanding uh, kind of the, the state of development with eBPF a little bit more. And lastly, um, <clears throat> how to connect potential eBPF programs with uh, the Kubernetes or cloud native ecosystem more broadly. Um, and uh, I'll show an example of what that could potentially look like. So without further ado, let's have um, a really quick introduction to eBPF. Now this won't be completely um, exhaustive of an explanation, but um, I just want to lay a little bit of uh, kind of information down so that uh, as we pro progress in the talk, we have a, a foundation that we can work off of. So um, essentially, what is eBPF? eBPF um, allows us to run um, certain programs in kernel space, um, and we can attach these programs to particular events or hooks. So um, some things that uh, people may be familiar with are k-probes or u-probes. Essentially what you're saying is you want to run this program every time a particular thing happens in the kernel. For example, a syscall gets executed. Um, <clears throat> and the reason why um, uh, we do this is um, so that we um, don't have this really expensive context switch when we, whenever we go from kernel space to user space. This is a like widely known fact that this transition is um, like something really expensive. And um, the reason why we're doing this is well, um, eBPF or um, the kernel and the operating system has traditionally always been a really great place to do observability, security, and networking. But uh, the reason why eBPF was necessary here was that um, with eBPF, we can now have a really flexible development model where um, we hot load this, this code into the kernel and execute it as part of kernel space without having to you know, load a kernel module, which we had to compile to a wide array, wide array of um, architectures and kernels and so, so on. Um, and um, even, even though it used to be really hard, some companies even still did that, right? Like Sysdig started that way. Um, and um, only eventually when eBPF came around, uh, adopted eBPF as a technology. So sometimes it was even then already worth it. But with, with eBPF, we're kind of um, uh, supercharging this uh, possibility. And um, I just want to give a really quick, uh, and a, it's really high level, but a really quick overview of how uh, this actually works. So eBPF, as I said, is kind of code that we can hot load into the kernel and um, it gets executed on hooks. And <clears throat> if you're uh, maybe new to this, uh, this sounds kind of dangerous, right? Like we're running something highly privileged in like with kernel privileges effectively um, in inside the kernel. Um, and so something that uh, was created in order to um, allow this is a spe spe uh, special just-in-time compiler uh, that is part of the kernel um, that uh, kind of transforms eBPF code, um, like eBPF bytecode, to um, actually executable code on that host. And before we even do that, before we even kind of load this program, uh, we verify that it will actually halt. And in order to do this, um, effectively we restrict what this code can do. Um, if you maybe remember from um, like computer science classes or if you've kind of seen, seen this uh, particular class of problem called the halt halting problem, it's actually kind of an unsolvable problem without diving too much into it. 
Um, <clears throat> and the way that eBPF kind of uh, makes this a solvable problem is by reducing the things that a pro program can do. And so things like endless loop, potentially endless loops or stuff like that uh, are not allowed or it's um, everything in an eBPF program essentially needs to be restricted in a way to make sure that it will actually halt and that it will only use a predefined amount of memory. Now we can still do bad enough things that will crash a kernel um, or will crash a, a, an, an operating system. But um, the point is that we um, can't essentially escape um, the, the security boundaries. And as we all know, uh, and as we probably, may, some of you may have heard this already, um, even that's not entirely safe. There have been bugs in the verifier. There have been bugs in various pieces of this. So we're not totally safe, but I guess that's the, the nature of all uh, programs. Um, but nevertheless, this is still really, really powerful and um, it's only gaining more traction. Um, but uh, going back to this, once we've actually loaded our eBPF programs and once they're executing on these hooks, the way that we then communicate with our uh, eBPF program or from our eBPF program to user space where our like, typical processes are um, is through BPF maps. And these are essentially, um, let th think of it as just kind of shared um, spaces of memory that both the user space program as well as the um, eBPF program, program can write and read from, write to and read from. And that's essentially um, all the moving pieces on, again, a really high level. But this is also where um, the problem kind of started in the um, early days of um, eBPF. Um, even though we are uh, compiling our eBPF programs to this generic bytecode, uh, there have been portability problems because even though this is just C code that we're compiling to eBPF, um, um, uh, bytecode, we still had to bring all the dependencies or we had to bring the kernel headers uh, that we were going to access because at the end of the day, we're doing this to do something in the kernel, right? Um, so most likely we're interested in something in the kernel. So we needed that those type informations. And so uh, the problem that this kind of created is that uh, we either had to compile our eBPF programs for all the possible kernels that we could think of that we would want to run our eBPF program on, or uh, we needed to ship a C compiler with our user space program that would compile the C code at startup and, uh, and then uh, essentially uh, require the, the, the kernel headers to be present on that host uh, so that we could be sure that um, kind of what we compiled is actually compatible with that host. Now that kind of brings multiple problems with it. We actually require the kernel headers to be present on that host. Um, and ultimately that results in really large um, artifacts. If we, for example, put all of this into a container image, that means that not only are we shipping our user space program, we're also shipping um, our C compiler. So LLVM, for example, um, and then not only that, uh, we're also, we also require to actually compile um, our program every time at startup, right? Or every time we create that container. Um, and aside from all of this being really expensive, it's kind of potentially dangerous, right? Because what we're doing is we're taking some arbitrary string that we're then compiling um, and then uh, <laughs> putting into kernel space to be executed, right? So you can imagine, uh, like even aside from potential vulnerabilities in the kernel about this, uh, now we're adding a bunch of uh, potential attack um, surface in our program. So uh, this is obviously something that the, the community has worked on and I'm gonna try to explain to you how uh, the community is, has essentially solved this. Um, Again, I'm, I'm a user of this. I didn't uh, create these mechanisms. So I'm going to try to explain them in um, the best possible way from my experience of using this and researching it and so on. Um, but essentially what the community um, has come up with is the, uh, a combination of this BPF type format, 
an, an, an overall initiative of that's called compile once, run everywhere. Kind of the mantra of what we just talked about in terms of portability, right? The, the goal of all of this is that we can just compile this once on you know, your, my machine, and then um, essentially run it on any kernel. That's, that's the goal. And so what the uh, BTF, um, the BPF type format essentially is, is it's a highly compressed version of the debug information. So essentially the, um, all of the information that we need uh, from kernel headers, um, and it puts that by default into the kernel. And so essentially what we're kind of removing in terms of requirements now is that the kernel headers, theoret in theory, at least all of the information is present on every kernel. Um, granted that they actually have, uh, are a new enough kernel to support this, right? Um, and the way that we can think of this is essentially that uh, BTF is kind of an abstraction um, on top of our um, actual data structures, right? And that's kind of one piece of the puzzle. And then the other piece of the puzzle is this new library um, called uh, libbpf. So if you've heard of eBPF uh, before, maybe you've heard of BCC, the BPF compiler collection. Um, this is essentially the next evolution of this. And it uh, works really closely with BTF. And effectively what it does is um, when we load a, a, an eBPF program on a kernel that has BTF enabled and the eBPF program was actually compiled with BTF support, then uh, it kind of rearranges and replaces the kernel structs that the eBPF program was compiled with, with the ones that are actually available on the host, right? And there's a lot of really complicated uh, like relocating stuff and kind of backward compatibility stuff that's going on here. Um, but essentially what we can, um, the, the, thing that, the thing that is important for us as users about this is that now if we use all of this, we have actually portable eBPF programs that we do not need to recompile when we start, um, start our, our user space program, but we can truly um, compile once and run it everywhere. Um, so this is really um, amazing. And um, this is essentially possible um, on, I think the, the earliest things uh, about BTF landed in uh, the 4.18 kernel, but effectively, um, if you actually want to make use of it, uh, the recommendation are um, distributions of these versions or higher. Um, and essentially what we do is when we compile our eBPF program, we generate this stub essentially, this VM Linux.h. These are kind of our <clears throat> headers that we're uh, compiling our eBPF program on you know, our machines with, um, with a C compiler with target equals uh, BPF. And when we then load it via libbpf, then um, all of this gets rearranged and it actually works on that kernel. So this is pretty magic. And uh, I'm thankful that all of this work has been done by the community. <clears throat> now, um, we're at KubeCon and pretty much everything in, in the cloud native ecosystem, or at least predominantly things are written in Go. So um, we at Polar Signals exclusively do Go as well. And so uh, we went on the lookout for uh, if anyone has written a library like that. And thankfully there was a start written uh, by Aqua Security. Um, <clears throat> now uh, this, when we started uh, working with the AquaSec people, um, not everything that we needed was necessarily implemented, but they had a really awesome start. So we contributed and uh, a lot and it, it's been a really great um, collaboration and we hope to do a lot more together with them on this library. <clears throat> but let, let me give you a really quick intro. Um, uh, essentially, um, libbpf go is, you know, just like um, many other uh, C wrappers, it's just a really thin uh, wrapper around the C bindings. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, a, a thin layer uh, of, of Go that essentially makes using all of this Go native. Um, and 
Then uh, to get kind of the entire end-to-end -end experience, we, uh, you know, as we said before, we pre-compile our eBPF program using BTF um, and uh, we embed that into our um, resulting Go binary using Go's uh, 1.16 built-in embedding functionality. And if we now take all of this and statically link libbpf um, into our uh, resulting binary, we truly have an actually portable bi eBPF uh, like user space program, right? And um, our eBPF program embedded into this so that we can then load it on any kernel. So now we've achieved true um, kind of portability of both our user space programs um, as well as our eBPF programs, right? Um, so this is, this is really awesome just for the portability aspect, but uh, we have multiple other uh, kind of advantages from this um, strategy. Of course, we don't need to ship a um, C compiler anymore. We don't have to have, you know, the extra kernel header packages installed on our hosts. <clears throat> and maybe most importantly, we have the comfort and safety of Go so that we can, uh, you know, create programs that are memory safe um, around our eBPF programs, which by the way, the verifier has been uh, tremendously helpful for us as well to make sure that uh, the things that we're doing in C are actually safe. So this is a really cool combination. So now I want to walk you through um, an actual example that we do at Polar Signals. So at Polar Signals, we do uh, continuous profiling and I won't go into too much about this, but essentially you can think of it as just normal CPU profiling. Um, and so what is profiling? Essentially, um, Profiling is finding out what our program is doing. Um, and we do that essentially by measuring where CPU, memory, or IO resources are being spent. And this works by uh, kind of capturing the stack traces um, that our program is you know, currently in um, a number of times per second. So let's say 100 times per second we're uh, taking these um, memory or CPU profiles. And if 10 of those observations were in one particular function, well, then we know um, statistically speaking, 10% of our time was spent in this function. And so effectively that's how um, like sampling profiling of CPUs works. Um, and then we typically um, visualize them using something like flame graphs or icicle graphs is what we call them when they are upside down essentially um, or other visualizations but this is just a really super quick um, intro to profiling in general and there is prior art um, for profiling in um, Linux so um, there's not, it's not entirely new and I think this is also something really important to understand about eBPF a lot of eBPF is not necessarily something that's entirely new. As I said earlier, there have been kernel modules around for similar things that we're doing with eBPF today. Um, but just kind of um, like the, the hooks have always been there, uh, like k-probes have been there, u-probes have been there. A lot of these things have already been there, but eBPF allows us to write really specific things that now are also, thanks to compile ones run everywhere, portable to every kernel, right? And so in Linux, there has for a while been the perf subsystem. Um, there's, there's kind of a lot of things uh, that are all called perf. So there's the actual Linux subsystem, perf events, and there's the user space tool to interact with the subsystem essentially um, and do you know, useful profiling things. And then there, there's the actual um, syscall called perf event open, which um, you can, which essentially the perf user space tool uses and inter interacts with to do all of these useful things. Um, and this is something that has existed, I believe, since the since the Linux 2.6 something. Um, so this has been around for a while. And uh, this is one of the kind of tools. And then another format that we really love at Polar Signals is uh, pprof. pprof is uh, a standard of how you can represent stack traces and 
as I said, essentially profiles are nothing but observations of stack traces. And pprof is a format um, in protobuf that represents stack traces in an, in an optimized way, essentially, um, with all of its metadata that you actually need to you know, make, make sense of the data ever, afterwards. So how do we actually build an eBPF profiler um, and maybe even in Go, right? Because uh, as I said, at Polar Signals, everything we do is Go. So we use libbpf Go. And this is actually one of those things that we implemented in libbpf Go. Um, when we started, the AquaSec folks didn't really have um, a use case for profiling. So they had never implemented this particular syscall that was required, um, sorry, not syscall, this particular uh, function in libbpf uh, called attach perf event um, because they just had no need for it. Uh, but kind of, this is the awesome thing about a community. They had implemented large other parts of a libbpf go wrapper. Um, and we just had to go in and do a couple of these um, contributions and you know everybody kind of profited from that. But effectively on a high level, how our eBPF profiler works is that we have a C group uh, because remember, um, containers essentially are nothing other than C groups and namespaces. These are two kind of um, mechanisms of, go, uh, of of the Linux kernel. Um, C groups allow us to um, to limit how much resources um, a set of processes can use, and namespaces are essentially to limit how much they can see. Um, and so together, these essentially make up what we usually refer to as containers. And so if we want to profile a container, we need to just understand which C group we want to profile. And so um, we essentially assume in this case that we already have our C group um, and we open a perf event um, on this C group and we tell it the frequency. So as I said earlier, let's say 100 times per second, we want to get an event from this, right? Um, and what we then do is we get a file descriptor back from this perf event and we pass that uh, file descriptor into um, attaching our eBPF program to this event, right? So now what we've essentially done with these two things is that we've created a perf event that triggers 100 times per second, let's say, um, and we have told it that it should run our eBPF program every time uh, this event fires. And so now all, all that we essentially need to do in our eBPF program is um, we grab the stack traces um, at that po point in time, right? We, we see, uh, let's walk through it for one of those events triggering, right? The first thing we do is we read the process ID uh, that the stack traces from. Then we uh, retrieve the user space stack. So essentially what is happening in the user space program, then what is the kernel space stack? And then we take all of this and we put it into our eBPF maps. And we have two maps in this case, one map just to identify our stack traces. So there's an ID for our stack traces and they're the actual memory addresses that you know make up this, uh, this stack trace because in the case of native binaries, so like compiled languages like Go, Rust, C++, it's truly that representation of the memory addresses uh, that map back to our actual binary. And that's how we can, at the end, make sense of what is being executed. So that's our first eBPF map. And then our second eBPF map is essentially that triple um, of process ID, user space stack, and kernel stack that um, is kind of the unique identifier for this stack trace, right? It's the process, the stack within that process, and the stack within the kernel. And then we say, how often have we seen this particular, um, this particular combination? And this is all the information that we need to build a CPU profile. And so all our um, user space program at the top here needs to do every 10 seconds, it just takes all of the data from these eBPF maps, puts them into 
a format that our um, tools understand. In this case, we chose to do pprof. Um, and then we can just throw away all of the data and do it again in 10 seconds after you know the ABPF program has filled up our ABPF maps again. So let's have an, a look at a little bit uh, um, simplified version of this ABPF program. So at the very top, we see this um, key that I was talking about, right? We have our process ID, we have our user space stack ID, our kernel space stack ID. Then what we're doing is we're uh, defining our two EBPF maps. Um, now there are some uh, helper functions that I omitted here, but essentially what we're doing is we're um, defining a map where we have our uh, key from above as the key um, and then uh, UN64. So just literally our count that we keep, are going to keep um, incrementing. Um, and then we have a map of stack traces, and this is kind of a built-in type in uh, eBPF. Um, and we just say we have stack traces in this map, and our stack traces are allowed to be um, this max stack addresses um, long. Because as I said in the beginning, eBPF cares a lot about everything being um, limited to some to some degree, right? So that we can be sure within these parameters, the eBPF program will succeed and will halt. And then the function that we have to find here is literally what's going to be executed whenever that um, that event triggers. So first we retrieve our process ID. We um, put that process ID as the first um, field into our key. We then retrieve our stack, um, uh, our user space stack ID, then our kernel space stack ID. And then we take this key, we look it up in our counts um, map, right? If it exists, um, we, we just take the count that we already have. If not, we initialize it. And then we do an atomic increment on that, um, on that number. And that's really it, right? Like, um, that's all we're doing. Uh, I, I simplified this a little bit, but effectively this is um, what we do. Now, I said earlier um, and I simplified that all we needed was the C group, right? Because all that um, containers are are C groups and namespaces. Now, um, how do we actually find uh, the C group, right? We, we, we you may know uh, in Kubernetes, we have the concept of pods and there can be multiple containers in a pod. And so we have all of this metadata in the Kubernetes API. Uh, so it must be possible to get the right C group for the right container, right? Um, and it turns out when we have the process ID, this is actually fairly simple. Um, the procfs actually has all of this information and can tell us um, all of this information. And uh, when I was researching this, I was like, wait a minute, there is a tool um, that abstracts container runtimes and I'm sure this tool would be able to help me with this. However, the problem is um, even though it's called container runtime interface, CRI, it's not actually specific to running Linux containers. Um, what it does is it abstracts away sandboxing and so the reason why this was done is so that we can have hypervisors like virtual machines instead of containers. Um, and so that's why there's actually no first class support for process IDs because we're not actually 100% certain that there is going to be a process ID involved here, right? So this left us in this somewhat unfortunate um, situation where the only thing that a, the CRI has specified is this kind of additional information um, map of strings to strings where the container runtime is uh, recommended to put the process ID into. <coughs> now, um, this is really precisely specified, right? Well, no, it's really, really not. And the, the, unfortunately, because it's so vaguely specified, uh, that's kind of what it resulted on in container runtimes as well. And so 
Uh, even though there's this recommendation, unfortunately, each, every CRI that we've worked with so far behaves very subtly different. Um, and so just a couple of examples here. Uh, Cryo, uh, a, a container runtime that was specifically <laughs> designed uh, for the CRI standard specification, has the string key info in the info field that is a JSON object that has PID as a field uh, that then actually contains the process ID. Docker actually asks you to use the Docker API to, to retrieve this. And the Docker API has this because Docker is actually specific to Linux containers, right? So this is kind of cool. However, it's not the CRI. Um, and then container D um, is kind of similar to Cryo, except that there isn't a, an entire JSON object in there. Um, there's just uh, a string that is an integer and you need to parse it to be the process ID. And then this is essentially what you need to do to find the process ID for each individual container um, in Kubernetes. And this was a little bit painful, but you know, after implementing all of it, it does work. Um, although it would have been nice if there was something a little bit more specified. So if we now put all of this together, we can retrieve the containers that are running on a host from the Kubernetes API. We can figure out uh, through the CRI and through um, all of what we just talked about, we can figure out the uh, actual C group from that container. We can attach our eBPF program to that C group, and then we can go through um, what we talked about earlier. We wait 10 seconds for our BPF program to fill up the maps. We can then read all of this information. We can transform it to the PPROF format that we know and love. Um, and then at this point, we can send this data away to a remote location, um, or we can save it to a file or something, right? But um, then we can just clear all of this data and you know, until eternity, do this um, again. Wait for 10 seconds, transform it to PPROF and so on. And so now what we've essentially implemented is a really low overhead uh, CPU profiler in eBPF. Um, and the reason why this is really cool is using eBPF, we can do this with extremely low overhead because we can already save um, this data in our maps in a way that is useful in our PPROF format. And that way um, we can create something that can just always be on and always be um, profiling all of our containers. And this is exactly what we did at Polar Signals and open sourced as a, an open source project called um, Parka Agent as part of the wider Parka project, which essentially is a storage for profiling data. Um, it's also open source. Um, and so um, I encourage you to try out this project, but um, even, even if not, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this talk and I hope you learned something about how you can make use of eBPF, um, how you can create uh, portable programs with eBPF, how you can make use of it from Go, um, and ultimately how you could maybe put some of these things together and even connect it to the wider cloud native ecosystem. If you're interested in checking out some of this, check out the website, or if you're interested in the profiling storage, we have a talk um, by my colleagues Matthias and Kemal as well about this. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, via email or Twitter. And if you're interested at all in any of these topics, we're hiring. So uh, feel free to reach out for that as well. Thank you so much.